Let's talk about instrumentation. Instrumentation is present in whatever industry you're going to work in as a mechanical engineer, whether you're working as a designer or somebody working on a process in a plant, operating machines, analyzing machines, doing any type of engineering work, eventually you're going to have to work with readings and measurements that were taken by some form of instrument. <clears throat> engineering measurements are usually taken by what we call a transducer. And when we say transducer, it's kind of a general term for just about any type of device that we use for measurement. What a transducer does is it transforms one form of energy into another. An example would be a thermocouple, which converts a temperature differential to an analog voltage. Another example would be a thermometer, where it's converting the temperature, the uh, excitement of the atoms and the liquid, and we're talking about a bulb thermometer, to a length. If you really think about it, what you're reading on the thermometer is the length of the red liquid in the tube. So that's what a transducer does. And we have transducers of all sorts of different types to read all sorts of different variables. Now when I say analog, analog means continuously variable. And this is as opposed to discrete. So if you know what a continuously variable transmission is, it's the difference between a conventional transmission and a continuously variable transmission. Another uh, example would be a dimmer versus a switch, where a dimmer you can adjust infinitely the brightness of a light, for example, in a circuit, whereas a switch only gives you a couple of discrete settings. And you might have, say, a three-way switch. It gives you off, dim, and bright. That would be a discrete system, which is what typically digital systems look like, whereas a continuously variable system would have this kind of analog behavior. Another example would be the audio signal from a vinyl record versus that from a compact disc. Talk to anybody who has music as like a really intense hobby or somebody who is what we would call an audiophile, somebody who really likes to listen to recordings and likes to talk about the fidelity of sound, will usually have strong opinions about the difference between digital sound, like what's stored on a compact disc, a bunch of binary numbers, and a vinyl record and using tubes as an amplifier, etc. So it's very interesting uh, to see the different applications for analog versus discrete signals. One other example would be an analog clock versus a discrete or digital clock. Now in this case, we would have to have a second hand that is rotating continuously instead of rotating once a second because that would automatically become discrete. But for the analog clock, what we have is this continuous motion of the second hand and then therefore the minute hand and the hour hand. They're moving ever so slowly, but they are moving and you can take a reading at any given point in time. And so whereas with the analog clock, you are reading any infinite ratio, so any small ratio inside this range, the discrete clock can only read to the minutes level. So if I was really, if I was able to pinpoint the exact snapshot of the second hand, the minute hand, the hour hand on that clock face, I would be only limited by the resolution by which I could read that clock face. Whereas with the discrete clock, I simply can't know any better than what it reads. So in this case, it would be to the one minute level. If I had seconds on the clock, then it would be to the seconds level. So that's the difference between analog and discrete. So usually we set transducers up for one of two kind of broad applications. One of these applications is where you've got a readout that you need to physically read. It's a visual indicator. And so as we look at that visual indicator, we're going to either take a reading like three times a day or something like that, or it's really just there for us to be able to monitor what the system's doing as we're standing next to it. So this is going to be really common. You know, you see this, for example, on any gas tank. You'll see a regulator and you're monitoring right there. You have the ability to read instantly the, tank in the pressure in the tank and then the pressure at the outlet of the regulator. And you can look there and see those differences. And so for applications like that, we use visual gauges. They're not always analog. Sometimes they are digital visual readouts, and we do that all the time. Um, so you'll see that in many different applications. Sometimes we need to take readings over, say, a really long time span. So say I need to take a reading every 10 seconds for five days and need to take it around the clock. I don't want to pay an engineer to sit there and do that. No engineer wants to sit there and do that. That doesn't make any sense. So we can automate that system by collecting the data digitally. And so usually what we do is one of two things. We either put a visual display or where we need to collect information in such a way that humans really shouldn't be doing it, then we're going to take, we're usually going to convert that to an electrical signal that is then read in by what we call an analog to digital converter, or ADC, through a data acquisition system 
then we can manipulate that data on a computer later. To do this, we need to condition the signal first, usually. Uh, generally, the signal isn't going to look exactly like we want it. We either need to scale it or we need to filter out unwanted frequencies. And so we use different signal processing tools to prepare this data for our analysis. A data acquisition system, or usually DAC for short, DAQ, is a system used to collect and record analog signals usually in digital or discrete form. So what we're going to do is convert this analog signal, this continuous signal, we're going to say this much resolution is okay, so I'm just going to I'm, I'm going to measure it with this kind of meter stick and stick it into the into the computer. And that quote unquote meter stick is bits of memory. We'll talk about that here in a second. And when I say analog to digital converter, that is the actual device, usually a microcircuit, that converts analog signals to that digital data, to those, to those digital signals. So let's look at an example. This is an Ashcroft 1008S analog pressure gauge. And this analog pressure gauge uses what's called a Borden tube. And a Borden tube design is this tube that is actually connected to the pressure that you are measuring. So this pressure that is put into the valve here, or in this case into this threaded stem here, is pushed up into this curved tube. This tube is actually hollow on the inside, this brass tube. And what's going to happen is as that pressure builds up, it's going to want to straighten that tube out. And that tube is going to straighten according to its elastic modulus. It's going to be an elastic deformation. And it's going to be just about linear with respect to the deflection angle about the center of that curve to the pressure. And so that linearity, we know that it's probably going to be linear at least over this range. But that's the motion of the needle. Usually what we find is we have either a mechanism or a gear in the back because the deflection of this actual curved tube is going to be really tiny. So we need to amplify that. So what we're doing is we're doing a mechanical signal processing of sorts. We are amplifying the signal mechanically. And this behavior is going to be analog. It's going to be continuous. If you increase the pressure just one tiny iota, it's going to increase the deflection one tiny iota. And there are other factors that affect the what we call the sensitivity of the instrument, and we'll talk about that too. But in this case, we'll just assume that we have this, this um, relationship, this infinitely variable relationship. So we can see here from the gauge that we're looking at that it has a full scale range of 0 to 100 PSI. What that means is that it has a full scale range of 100 PSI. If it read 50 to 150 PSI, it would also have a full scale range of 100 PSI. It's the difference between the two numbers, not the absolute value. The resolution is the smallest measurement that, that a change in the input variable, in this case pressure, that can be indicated that it can be detected and indicated. So in this case we look and what are the smallest graduations here? And we can say, well that's 60, that's 70, so then we have five measurements in between. So two PSI is the smallest resolution. And so we can't really register much of a change beyond what we can read on the face of this device. The accuracy is different than the resolution. The accuracy of the device is the deviation of the reading from the real value. In other words, if I put exactly 14.7 PSI into this thing, is it going to read, 14, if I could read it perfectly, would it read 14.7 PSI? What would that actually look like? And if I did this on each one coming off of the line, would I get the same reading? No, I'm going to get variation. I'm going to get some statistical variation. And so there's usually a... Uh, specification from the manufacturer that says this is the accuracy of the instrument. So if you take a reading of exactly 60 PSI, it's right in the middle of the line, 60 PSI, then how far off will that be? And in this case, from the data sheet for the, the Ashcroft gauge, it's 1.6% of the full scale. So in this case, it's 1.6 PSI either way. So if I'm reading 60, precisely 60 on my scale here, that means that the actual pressure going into the thing is somewhere between 58.4 and 61.6 .6 PSI. So there's going to be some standard error based on the actual Young's modulus of the tube used, etc. Accuracy is usually referred to, uh, it fits into the category of systematic error. And so uh, error related to the instrument itself. There's also random or human error to contend with. 
a couple of sources. We'll, we'll go over a couple of sources here. One is the graduations. I can only read within a certain space inside those graduations. So because of the resolution, I can't get a very fine reading off of this. And so we usually say that due to graduations like this, if we have graduations that we're reading, that you can estimate to within plus or minus one PSI. We'll call that a human error because you can't read more accurately than that. Another source of human error could be parallax. And the picture that we have here is actually very good for showing this. If I take a needle reading based on the position of the photographer with respect to this picture, if it looks like it's hovering over 60, it's actually a little past 60 because of the angle difference between me, the needle, and the face. So this is called parallax error. You'll find that really high quality gauges will usually either have the needle just barely off the surface so that it minimizes that parallax error, or you might have a mirror to help align your pupil across the needle into the into the readings. And so there are a number of different ways that you can attack this, and uh, but it is a, a common thing to, to pay attention to. When you're taking a reading, make sure you're taking it straight onto the needle so that you're getting a good alignment of the needle with the actual reading. This is an SSI Technologies P51-100 pressure transducer. This is essentially the same device, or does the same thing, as what we just did with the Ashcroft 1008S, except this is based on a different type of relationship. It's not based on a Borden tube. It's based on a different type of uh, first principles kind of function. And this puts out a uh, an analog voltage signal that we will then convert to a digital signal, or we could read it into a voltmeter if we wanted to and do the conversion by hand. But this is a different type of transducer, but it measures the exact same thing. This uses what's called a strain gauge diaphragm design. There's a little diaphragm inside this, so we have our pressure coming in to our threads here. And across here, there's a diaphragm, a flexible metal diaphragm, and it has a strain gauge on it. The strain gauge is going to measure the deflection of that diaphragm, and then we're going to blow that resistance signal, we're going to convert that to a voltage and then blow that up with an amplifier. And it's going to send me a signal that, an electrical signal that is linearly related to the pressure. This has a full scale range of 100 PSI G. Now when we put a G at the end of the PSI that means it's a gauge pressure. You can kind of see in the side of the gauge there's a hole up here. And what that hole does is it exposes the back end of that diaphragm to the atmosphere. As a result, whatever the atmospheric pressure is on the outside, if you don't put any pressure into the, the pipe nipple there, you get zero deflection. So it's only measuring with respect to the atm atmosphere where it's placed at. So we call this gauge pressure. It's the difference between what you're putting into the gauge and what the gauge is sitting at. You might find absolute pressure uh, measurements in different fields depending on what you do. And in those cases, these are sealed at a atmospheric pressure, such that if you took this up to the top of a mountain, you would already have a reading without putting any pressure on it. So different gauges are transducers for different applications. In this case, this is a gauge pressure. But this has the same full scale range, 0 to 100 PSI. The resolution, however, this is an analog device. So it's putting out an analog signal, but we don't have a scale to look at yet. We haven't connected it to a digital acquisition system. So the resolution is going to be re dependent on the data acquisition system we select. We'll talk about that. The accuracy in this case from the manufacturer, again, it's on a spec sheet, is 0.5% of the full scale, plus or minus. So plus or minus 0.5 PSI, less than one third the accuracy, in other words, three times as good as the accuracy uh, of the other device. Now, there are still sources of random error here, but they're not usually human error. And in this case, the biggest one is going to be noise. We're going to have noise in our signal. Whether we're sitting in a room with fluorescent lamps and those are creating an electric field that is then being read by the wire because it's not shielded correctly or something like that, we'll get sometimes frequencies and signals that, that don't make sense or don't really uh, apply. At the same time, we might have just a signal we're measuring a pressure that is all over the place and is just 
varying widely very quickly and we can't get a good reading because the response is so fast and it, it might mismatch with the response of the, the transducer. And so we have to figure out how we're going to filter out noise <clears throat> from our electrical signal. At the same time, we might have an electrical signal, depending on the transducer, that's really small. So we need to amplify it. Well, when you amplify it, you also amplify the noise. So signal processing is really important with these devices that are putting out these analog signals. The input voltage for this is the voltage supplied to power the transducer. And this will vary in, in the way that you do it from one transducer type to the next. We're going to go over one type here. There are other types elsewhere on the website, and we'll, we'll have tutorials up for those. But in this case, you can supply anywhere from 8 to 30 volts DC, and it doesn't care. You could, you could give it 9.7 volts, and it will power the device just fine and it won't affect your output. So that's nice. They do that so that you can put a 12 volt battery on it, you can put a 9 volt battery on it, you can put a 24 volt DC source on it, you can put any number of those sources on it and, and it will function just fine. It'll scale the voltages itself. The output voltage for this is 1 to 5 volts DC. So what it's going to do is it's going to scale the pressure. If you put 0 PSI into it, it'll give you an output of 1 volt. If you put 100 PSI into it, it will give you an output of 5 volts. If you give it 50 PSI, it will give halfway between 1 and 5. So, in other words, 3 volts. So, that's the way that this particular device functions. There are other relationships between input voltage, output voltage, and the full scale range in the reading. This is only one of several. Now, Let's have a brief diversion. We're going to talk about number systems for a moment because we need to. Let's talk about the decimal number system, the number system we use for adding, multiplying, subtracting, counting, that type of thing. If we think about it, what we're doing is we've got a series of switches and <clears throat> each switch has 10 settings, 0 through 9. The first switch denotes the multiplier of 10 to the 0 here. And so this switch can have either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to multiply that by 10 to the 0, which is 1. We've known this as the 1's place, and the 10's place, and the 100's place, and the 1,000's place. It's just powers of 10. 10 to the 0 is 1. 10 to the 1 is 10. 10 to the 2 is 100. 10 to the 3 is 1,000. And so what we're doing is we're giving each one of these columns a value from 0 to 9. And so in this case, let's say we have 2 in the 10 to the 0 place, or 2 in the 1's place. 4 in the 10 to the 1 place, or the 10's place, 7 in the 100's place, and we've known this since first grade, 700 plus 40 plus 2 is 742. That's how we add. Uh, so the numbers are multiplied by their header value, and then they are added. So 7 times 10 to the 2 plus 4 times 10 to the 1 plus 2 times 10 to the 0 is 742. Now, the binary system works the exact same way, except the switches only have two settings, off and on. This is really useful because transistors are switches, and we can make them really tiny, and we can easily control them with a computer. In fact, computer memory is nothing but a bunch of transistors. Well, computer processors and, and memory banks are transistors. We're coming up with all sorts of different ways to, to do memory these days. But the standard language is binary, and so we have 0 and 1, and that's it. So the switches only have two values, therefore they're multiplied by successive powers of 2 instead of 10. Here's an example. We've got 1 times 2 to the 0 plus 0 times 2 to the 1 plus 1 times 2 to the 2 plus 0 times 2 to the 3 plus 1 times 2 to the 4. And if we do that math, we come up with 21 in decimal. In binary, it's 10101. But in decimal, we would call that 21 if we were counting up. So back to instrumentation. When we read an instrument, like a gauge, like what is shown on the screen here, all we're doing is converting the position of that needle on the dial that we see and comparing it to graduations and kind of doing this comparison in our heads to say, okay, it's greater than this, but less than this, and so the reading must be X. So if the needle was between 60 and 62 and it was like right in the middle, I would estimate 61 PSI and call it good and it would have a standard resolution error of plus or minus one psi because it's half the resolution so what we are doing in our minds is basically the same thing that an analog to digital converter does it uses a series of comparators which is a, a small circuit to determine the voltage level at different bits and so 
uh, because these analog devices we're working with generally have theoretically continuous behavior, the resolution that this analog to digital converter can use is limited usually by the bit depth of this analog to digital converter. So when I say bit, what I mean is the most basic unit of memory is a bit. It's a representation of a binary number. It's really based on a transistor switch. It's either on or off. And with a series of switches, I can represent a binary number. So the number of divisions that I get over a full scale reading, so the number of different combinations of switches that I can have, is 2 to the n, where n is the bit depth of the analog to digital converter. Let's look at an example. Here we've got five switches. The first switch represents the 2 to the 0 power. The second switch represents 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4. If we think about this and look at our number, and this is from our previous example, 10101, that means with five switches or five bits, I can represent up to 32 divisions. So 32 numbers or um, 32 different values that I can come up with. And so if I evenly space those over my reading range for the analog to digital converter, whether I'm reading, say, 0 to 5 volts, if I space that over 32 divisions, then I can figure out what my resolution is effectively. And so here, 5 bits gives me 32 divisions, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 through 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So to get some idea of how we get from analog signal to digital numbers in the computer for our instruments, let's take a look at a scenario. Let's say we have a pressure transducer that's reading 0 to 100 psi, and that that pressure transducer has a voltage output of 0 to 5 volts, where it's reading 0 volts at 0, PS, 0 psi and 5 volts at 100 psi. So we've got this analog signal here that can actually be continuous. It can be anything in between. It is more or less infinitely, uh, or has more or less infinite resolution, with the exception that usually there's a sensitivity level that determines the smallest change that that instrument is capable of actually registering. And so in a theoretical sense, where we would like this to be completely continuous, it's not exactly continuous, but for all intents and purposes compared to the resolution we're going to get with a digital device, it is. So. Let's say for a moment that we're going to read this in with a 3-bit digital converter, analog to digital converter. Now, 3 bits is absolutely tiny. It's ridiculous. You're probably never going to see a 3-bit signal. The reason we're using 3 bits here is because it's easy to draw. And so remembering how binary numbers work, we have for 3 bits, 2 to the 3 or 2 cubed is 8. So we have 8 different possible uh, bit numbers here. Uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, all the way up through 1, 1, 1. And so we see that we have eight bins into which we can place our signal. And so what we're going to do is we're going to see an analog signal over here. Our transducer is going to convert that to a voltage, and that's going to be continuous. It's
So what happens if my analog device is putting out a voltage range different from the voltage range that my analog to digital converter is reading in? Visually, we can kind of see the effect here. I'm not reading these two bits here, whether that turns out to be exactly on one of those uh, kind of thresholds or not, especially when you have a large number of bits, it's almost insignificant, almost. Um, but the point is that we're not using the full capability of our analog to digital converter to resolve that signal. Where before we were reading 0 to 100 PSI over this entire range, and so I got eight bins. Now we can see that I'm dividing that 0 to 100 PSI range over only six bins, and that's not very many. And so, so we've reduced the number of bins that we have, therefore increasing the number for R here. Uh, increase, uh, actually, sorry. Uh, So let's do a real world example. Let's take this actual pressure transducer, 0 to 100 PSI, 1 to 5 volt output. We're going to connect it to a 10-bit analog to digital converter that can read 0 to 5 volt signals. This is exactly what is in an Arduino. Arduinos have an analog uh, to digital converter, 10 bits, 0 to 5 volts. So say I'm hooking this up to my Arduino, and I want to use the Arduino to do pressure control of some sort. The resolution that I would get in PSI for the analog to digital converter for this range would be, again, our standard equation, 5 volts times 100 PSI over 2 to the 10th because I have 10 bits, and again, it's the unipolar, and I'm, I've got a 4 volt range here on the device. So that gives me 0.122 PSI per bin, so to speak, in my, in my uh, resolution. So my, my output resolution from the device total is 0 0.122 PSI. So this is called zero order uncertainty of the instrument. So we have a, a number of different sources of error. In this case, we're using an instrument that is basically disconnected from human interaction. So a lot of the human error that we've considered in other experiments is not going to be 
present here in such a significant way. We're only going to consider two sources for right now. There are a number of different sources with signal processing and signal quality and a number of other factors that can really affect your ability to get good readings. Right now we're just going to take into account two, the resolution of the device and the stated accuracy of the device as given by the manufacturer's instructions. To combine these, whether we're combining two, three, four, seven, twenty-seven sources of error, we usually add them using the root sum square. So let's take these two major error sources, the transducer accuracy and the analog to digital converter resolution, and combine them. So we have the transducer accuracy, if you think back, of 0 0.5 PSI, was 0.5% of the full scale range. And so this is a state, statement by the manufacturer, they will do repeated measurements and compare them to real world values and, and use that to calculate the error. And then we have our error due to the resolution. And we're going to, again, half the resolution because we're going to round one way or the other. And so we're only going to be off by one half of that resolution in either direction. So the, the resolution itself is kind of uh, a, a width that we're going to compare on either side of the actual average measurement. So our error due to the resolution is plus or minus 0 0.061 PSI, half of 0 0.122. So the total uncertainty to the, due to these two sources is going to be calculated by the equation that we see here. We get 0 0.504 PSI is our, is our standard error or uncertainty in this measurement due to the transducer accuracy and the resolution of our 10-bit 10 10 analog to digital converter. We see a couple of things straight away. One of these is that our resolution error is about an order of magnitude smaller than our accuracy and that's really good. What that means is it's not going to increase it very much and we see that. We see that 0 0.504, this 0 0.5 is what's dominating this equation. So it doesn't add very much in terms of uh, actual additional error. Now when we calculate an uncertainty like this we have three significant figures here. Five, zero, and four are all significant we almost never use more than one significant figure in an uncertainty calculation or measurement. We just never do. These numbers, especially because of the way that we combine them and the different sources of error, are all estimates and they're all going to be based on either stati statistics or some random statistical distribution and as a result they're not going to be that accurate. So we usually only use one significant figure unless this first value in that significant figure was a 1. If that was 0 0.104, then we would report two significant figures, 0 0.10, to reflect that. That's because if I round from 0 0.14 down to 0 0.1, that's a 40% change, roughly. That's a, that's a huge percentage change in... Uh, in the actual error that I'm, I'm trying to relate. Here, even if I go from 0 0.54 to 0 0.5, so if this second digit was a 4 and I rounded that down to 0 0.5 PSI to report it, that's less than a 10% change. That's not very much. And so if the first digit is a 1, then you can report two significant figures, never more than two. So in this case, the resolution actually doesn't add significant enough error to even really wind up being reported. So it's, it's very small, but you still need to calculate it to ensure that. So what we're going to wind up with is, if I measure an actual pressure of 46.90 PSI, say that's the real pressure going into the device, and I have no way of actually knowing that. I'm using my transducer to see what it says this pressure is. The measurement that I'm going to get is 46.8 because of the resolution. So the resolution is only going to resolve a certain, uh, be able to resolve down to a certain level, 0.122 PSI. So we're going to expect that, that could be as far off as 0 0.122 PSI or so. So 46.9, what we actually wind up with after rounding is 46.8 PSI plus or minus 0 0.5 PSI. Now the way that I've written this is actually pretty intentional, so we have to be careful about this. I have three significant, three significant figures here and one here. This is defined because I have one significant figure in my error uncertainty number, and so that's 0 0.5 PSI. That means that I can't reasonably report this number with any more precision than that. So I can take this down to the 
tenths place, the 0.8 psi, I can take it no further than that. Because if I say 46.87794 psi, those last four numbers don't mean anything. They're, they're useless because they're inside my uncertainty. So 46.8 psi, so this decimal place and this decimal place should match. And this should not have more than one or in some cases two significant figures. Also, I report the units in both cases just so the reader knows that I have 46.8 psi plus or minus 0 0.5 psi. And those two units should match if you can make them match. So, so this is kind of the standard way of doing it. So what we've done is taken an instrumentation system. We've put it into uh, uh, an analog digital converter and read in some values and then looked at how those values are affected by the uncertainty due to the accuracy of the instrument and the precision because of the analog to digital converter. There are a lot of other factors at play here. There are a lot of other sources of error. There are a lot of other um, possibilities for uncertainty propagation. There are just a lot of factors to, to deal with as we're selecting instrumentation. For a better discussion of some of the intricacies of uncertainty propagation, etc. There will be other presentations.